Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, good to see you all. I'm Richard Sambrook. I'm a professor of journalism and director of the Centre for Journalism at Cardiff University, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here to uh, chair this, I think, final session on news. And I'm joined by um, uh, two great people from Sky News. We've got on my direct left, Martin Stanford, who's one of their longest serving programme hosts and anchors. Um, and on his left is Neil Dunwoody, who's the editor of their editor digital, as they call it, editor of all their digital platforms and so on. So we're going to talk a little bit um, about what does it take to, uh, to make it in particularly Sky News, but, but in TV and broadcast news today. Please put up your hands at any point during the discussion if you want to ask a question. We're not going to kind of herd all the questions into a, a, a little pocket at the end. So please um, just put up your, your hands at any stage if you want to come in. have got a couple of clips to play through it, but we're just going to get into a discussion a little bit about broadcast news and, and see how we get on. Uh, and at the end of the session, we do have a quiz for all of you, but also for, uh, for Neil and Martin as well. So uh, uh, the kind of quiz that you get asked if you're uh, applying to join Sky News. So we'll, uh, we'll see how we all get on with that as well. But this is very much your session, uh, and obviously uh, Martin and Neil, uh, and even maybe myself, are happy to answer questions at any stage. Um, Sky News, of course, is a uh, leading news broadcaster here. It's got uh, reach into 107 million homes in 118 countries. Uh, it's not just a UK broadcaster by any means at all. And of course, it's not just on TV. And as we'll hear, it's also on the phone, on the tablet, on radio, uh, and on other connected devices, on your watch and on your fridge shortly as well, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, Martin, can I start with you? As, mm. as one of the longest serving presenters and anchors on Sky News, you, you've seen all the major stories of the last 20 years or more, probably. Tell us briefly over that time, what's changed in terms of how you work, what's expected uh, of the skills within a newsroom, um, uh, and how that's impacting journalism in the field? Sure. Well, thank you, Richard, and thank you for uh, inviting us here today. It's very kind to use a euphemism like longer serving. It just means old. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't quite go back to black and white days, but I certainly the, the television picture was square, not rectangular. When I first started at Sky News, um, it was in colour. Uh, and then we went widescreen, you know, 16 by 9 aspect ratio, all very exciting. And uh, then a few years ago, we went high definition. Um, so I've seen all those changes in terms of the kind of technical approach that we have to adopt to. High definition for um, a code word for presenters or a bunch of presenters is love is, or as one of my uh, superiors used to say, a bunch of powder puffs, and there used to be several expletives in front of that because um, he wasn't our fans. Uh, but high definition was a major concern, of course, for the uh, moisturising regime you used, and <laughs> in particular, certainly for the fellas, uh, what time of day you had a shave because uh, five o'clock shadow became a real problem, however much makeup you put on once high definition come around. Um, I personally, as a sort of techno fan, can't wait for 4K, but I think there might be some shocking images of exactly what presenters really look like when we get round to that super ultra high definition stuff. In terms of what's changed, Richard, um, I think in a sense a huge bunch of stuff has changed and we can reflect on how we do our storytelling and who we're storytelling for and how we get our product, and I, ha I hate to use that term, but it is, I suppose, in many ways a product. How we deliver that to customers, to viewers, whether it, on, on any devices that's changed. But you know, I guess what hasn't changed is a cracking story. Huh. And television, as against my first um, employer and my first love, which was radio, where I think the old adage, the pictures are even better, because it's down to me as a communicator to paint those pictures for you. Um, pictures still drive a great story. And it's those times, I think, that we in the Rolling News channels, um, a lot of the time I think we, we, we're to an extent treading water a bit, and then a big story comes along. And even now, with all due respect to Neil and the phone and the tablet and everything else, just occasionally a story comes along where you have to go and find a TV and watch it on TV. And if we could uh, use our first example here, the flooding around southern England, 
Um, and we can get into another discussion about whether the flooding had been in Newcastle, in uh, Neil's home territory, or on the Welsh borders, or even in Cardiff, whether, you know, the metropolitan elite would have covered it so much. But hey, this was in Raysbury, in my village of Datchet and Windsor, and places we'd heard of. And of course, it was therefore a massive, massive story. But it, it stretched our resources, and of course, with water and water everywhere, it actually stretched the best of our camera kit as well. But we have some quite resourceful reporters these days whose expertise I'd like to share with you. Here's an example from our reporter who's actually based in the north of England but was dragged all the way down to the London area to help out, Nick Martin, who uh, has got the right equipment now and an iPhone to do this. Well, it's, it's been quite a remarkable sight here in this part of Chertsey's stage. You can see the fire service there uh, doing their job and the army who've been drafted in. Now a minute ago I was on the back of a lorry as uh, some people were being uh, evacuated, small children, a three-year-old and a 18-month-old uh, and that was the only way that they could get out of their house if the army came to help them. Uh, this is the kind of vehicle that you can see here that has been drafted into this part of the world. And you can see just here as well, people with canoes and there's some ambulances, the Gurkha Regiment, the Royal Engineers, they're all here trying to help. But when we walk down this road in a minute, the depth of the water is quite astonishing. In some parts it's above the waist uh, and uh, you have to really be careful with what you do when you walk around. And if we just look down here we can see people with canoes trying to help do all they can and down in the distance there the Royal Engineers on a military boat uh, helping the residents evacuate from this street and the wind and the rain continues to lash this part of the world and you know you can only see the effect that it's having as the muddy water continues to rise here and this is happening right now for these residents. You can see, sitting there on the boats, being evacuated, thanks to the army and the military, and that's all they can do. So that was an example of what Nick was doing, and he actually did three or four days of that kind of stuff to augment other ways of getting the picture back. But it was simply um, an app on your iPhone and a 4G SIM card in it meant that the data connection is good enough to get that kind of broadcast quality. So, well, there's a couple of things about that, though. I mean, first is the technology. So he's, he's basically broadcasting live with a selfie stick. Yeah. Isn't it? Uh, to use the is, um, yeah. technical for, for, you know, terms. Um, but also, it, it, he's got the live broadcasting skill to be able to walk and talk mm. and explain the story as he does it. We shouldn't take that for granted because I know when I started in television news many decades ago, I mean reporters stood right. like that with a script and yeah. never moved. Yeah. But actually, you know, it's a skill to be able to walk and talk and use the new technology and, mm. you know, what other kind of ranges of skills if you're out in the field now uh, are expected? In well, I, mean, I, I would just make the point that, um, I, mean, I was thinking the same as you, Richard, um, you know, reporters, if you wanted to be a TV reporter, not that long ago, standing doing a piece to camera outside the local Crown Court was probably the extent of your, uh, your abilities in terms of pieces to camera and talking live. And I think that was a really good example of what we now expect reporters to be able to do in television. I say television, I mean all platforms, really all screens. Um, what we did during the Scottish referendum, we sent a reporter, Joe Tidy, to, the, uh, to Shetland actually, and he had a phone, an iPad and a camera, and he was completely self-sufficient and he shot 10 packages essentially on his phone, edited them on his phone and iPad and sent them back uh, to base and we ran them on the television. And that was a reporter on his own with very little kit. Uh, we got quite a lot of content for digital platforms and for the TV from this guy operating on his own. And really that they are the skills that if you want to be a reporter for a big news organisation. That's almost what we're expecting. I did some interviews very recently for the West of England correspondent job for Sky and everyone who was in the interview could use a camera and sh self-shoot. That's not to say we expect them to self-shoot. There are three great cameramen in Bristol working for Sky News who cover all of the West of England. But we want them 
we want the ability to be able to send them out and film their own stuff. So they've got to be able to shoot, edit as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, know, you oversee some of the, the work experience and the internship yes. programs for Sky News. So what are you looking for, for, for when, you, when you bring people in successfully? What do you expect them to have? Overall, what, what, what about their attitude? What's the oh, range yeah. of skills? What, okay. you know, how much? So, I, I run the work experience uh, program at Sky News. We take about 60 people a year. Um, we open up applications twice a year. What we're, when hundreds of people apply, obviously, and we whittle it down to about 30 per six months. And it tends to be a production role that we get people in to do. So, what we're looking for is massive enthusiasm, obviously, a lot of work experience in a journalistic environment already. You need to kind of, students need to distinguish themselves from their competitors because if we've got a range of 10 applications and they're all quite good and they've all been to good universities doing journalism degrees or postgraduate uh, degrees something needs to make them stand out from the crowd. So, you know, that kind of work experience, if you've done three or four things already, at newspapers, radio stations, that kind of thing, we really take a lot of notice of that. Um, but we also want people to uh, know a lot about Sky, if they're coming to Sky, be switched on about Sky News and its digital uh, operation as well as its TV coverage. And we want them to be enthusiastic. And actually, ultimately, we're going to invite these people in for three weeks to Sky to be part of a team. And if I, we interview them by, the ones who get through to the final round, we interview them by Skype. Um, and actually there are some people who've done quite well in the application process who I will then interview, and if I think they're not gonna fit into the team because they haven't got the right attitude, then we won't have them in. So that's what we're looking for in students, to be honest. And my message to them, and also, well, my message to them is, as well, know what's in the news on a given day, because that is not necessarily taught at colleges or universities. It's not part of the curriculum. We just expect students to know, you know, who's in the cabinet, who's the Archbishop of Canterbury, what's going on in America, all the current issues uh, around in the news. And the number of times people let themselves down by not having a clue about what's going on in the world of news is amazing. OK, I think we've got one gentleman who wanted a question. Can you just wait for the microphone? Because we need to record it. Thank you. Just put your hand up if anyone else wants to butt in at any stage, otherwise we'll just keep going. Hi, um, I'm Nick DiMaggio. Um, I'm very interested in your case study that you've got about the floods as a, an illustrated example. Um, can we talk a little bit more about the citizen journalist, the guy with the iPhone and the iPad and his own camera? Are the skills that you're talking about recognising opportunities? Because the, the vast damage of the floods occurred during the Christmas Eve period in the south of England. 20 miles from here, families got evicted on Christmas Eve from their, underneath their Christmas trees. They, they didn't have their Christmas lunch. They had to move out, mm. friends and families. Now, would the modern students that you're after say, oh, it's too cold outside, it's too wet? Well, uh, if I just chip in, I think in all this, we just need to hold on a minute and underline the basics, which is they still need to be a journalist and have the skills. So you want to be able to find out, and you know, an insatiable curiosity, the who, what, why, where, and when skills need to be there. Uh, to have a bit of bolshiness, not to take no for an answer and kick down doors, metaphorically or otherwise, of course that needs to be there. I mean, it's all very well. Nick Martin is a bloody good journalist, but, and he would have, that's all very well him showing off, I can look, I can wave a, a, an iPhone around. But if he had nothing to say, if the facts weren't there, if the facts are your friend, that meant, I think still applies. So you've got to be able to assemble the story. Then the added layer is to be able to tell that story almost in any circumstances. And still, I think route one for all of us is you still, while we're lucky enough to have the craft skills in hand, I'd prefer, I shoot them stuff for, for various bits of telly, I can knock off an interview. I'd rather have a craft cameraman and preferably a sound out as well with me every single time. And then I give it to a craft editor to cut. Preferably. That's route one. Sometimes in the realistic world, of course, that's simply not available. So to get back to your story, I don't, so just to be clarified, the example was Nick, that's a professional journalist working. Citizen journalists, I think, opens up, Richard, a whole mm. other area of where you engage with citizen journalists. Do we use their material? How do we authenticate it? Um, which is a big headache, actually, mm. for producers and managers back at base. Is that the point you were making? That, it, it, that it certainly is. I'd also be interested in the impact which Sky has with its news reporting in relation to the issues that it reports. 
Do you follow up on the effect it has on local policies, local governments? Have we done follow-up stories about whether David Cameron's boast that he had plenty of money no. and he was going to fix the flooding? Yes, we have, and he lied. So, okay, before we, before we get into the kind of holding Sky News to account but our business, <laughs> uh, which of course we could do, but actually not, not, the, not the core of what we're doing. I mean, I, I would say if any student is in the middle of a flood and thinks mm. it's too cold and wet to go out, they should think of a different profession Career. because they're never going to make yeah. it. Um, but citizen journalism, I mean, talk, Neil, talk a little bit about, you must get a lot of contributed material and pictures coming in. Mm -hmm. You know, I know you did at the BBC when I was there. I'm sure Sky mm. must as well. Yeah. What's the process you go about for authenticating that? Mm. First of all. Well, there's a, there's a rigorous process. Um, we have a digital news editor who is the first person who would assess the veracity of material, and that is contacting them essentially and trying to uh, verify that whatever they've contributed is um, what it's pur purported to be. So I think um, if stuff has come in on a social media uh, platform, then we need to contact them through social media. We can phone them, email them, and we will not run anything until we're absolutely sure um, that that is what it's purported to be. There are other ways of checking. We can phone the, you know, when um, reports were coming in of the Vauxhall um, helicopter crash a, a year or so ago, you know, you can, you can start phoning the emergency services and saying, look, we're getting a lot of Twitter traffic or whatever about this thing that's happening at Vauxhall. Is that, that yes, we've sent, you know, five police cars or whatever. So there are ways of checking. We can also, you know, if there happens to be um, lots of content around the same thing, you start using common sense and thinking, okay, there's quite, there's a bit of a head of steam building up here on this and a few people are talking about it. Um, but the, the, the key message here is we don't just put anything on air that happens to come in. I remember doing a sunrise programme one year when there was an earthquake, bizarrely, in Skegness or Lincoln or something. It was an overnight story, just a few rumbles. And we had stuff, we were desperate for pictures. We had nothing to illustrate this story whatsoever other than a map. Um, and I remember some pictures came in, and it was obvious it was just students kind of wobbling the camera, saying, hey, look at us, <laughs> you know, we, we got caught in the earthquake. Um, and you know, you're so desperate to put something on, because it's five o'clock in the morning, and you've got a show to put on at six o'clock, but you just, you just check that, and you think this is kids having a prank, really. And it's really, really important for everyone's brands, not just Sky, but BBC, ITV, every news brand, not to put something on that cannot be, uh, you know, proved to be accurate. Now, when we talked about reporting quite a lot, we, we touched on presenting. What are some of the other roles in the newsroom that mm -hmm. um, you know, people need to think about you know, possibly moving into? Well, um, there are a lot of production rules in newsrooms, and really that's my side of the business, really. I mean, I've been a reporter very briefly years ago, um, but a lot of people are involved in newsrooms in producing content. So Nick Martin in that video is a news gatherer, essentially. He, we call them the news gathering team. They go out and they gather the news, and then the producers back at base, of which I am one, uh, will process that material, decide is it the lead story, the second story, the third story, is it the and finally story, or are we not running this material at all because that's not what we want. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people come in saying, you know, I want to be a foreign correspondent, I want to be a reporter, I want to be a presenter. The really good place to start for a lot of journalists coming in from courses that you're probably all involved with is, is a production role because they get to know the different platforms, they get to know different techniques of production, how to handle content, the fact that you know a TV package will not play very well on a mobile phone application because they, we want raw video or we want some other treatment. Um, so yeah, obviously there's the big big production um, teams at Sky and what we're done at the BBC and elsewhere and you know what we're trying to do at the moment is get rid of the silos that existed which were TV, just TV producers and just digital producers and now we're kind of crashing them together and everyone's going to do everything. So aside from news gathering, uh, production, there are a lot of people who work in the graphics and creative areas as well, as well as the technical crews who you know, do editing and camera work and all of that kind of thing and work on the satellite trucks. And, and I mean, there are a lot of new roles evolving, particularly with social media and so on. Yes. I mean, I find you know, from Cardiff, we're getting people into roles that didn't exist even a year ago, yeah. you know, um, community manager and um, you know, digital content, whatever. That's I mean, right. so, so all of these roles are evolving yeah. developing quite rapidly yeah. now. I mean, it's a hugely exciting time, I think, because, 
you almost feel like you are in the middle of some kind of revolution. Things are changing really fast. Uh, John Riley, who's the head of Sky News, uh, a couple of months ago said to me, right, this is on a Monday afternoon at four o'clock, right, Neil, by Wednesday, I want you to set up a mobile phone team. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a team of producers who are doing nothing but content for mobile phone. And we've got a, we just brought in a new social media team uh, three or four months ago. So that was a new development as well. So things are changing really fast and we're trying to adapt internally uh, with our organization to reflect that. Great. OK, well, we'll come back to that. We've got a couple of questions here. Then, sorry, it's, um, if you can just wait for the microphone and then say who you are. And then we've got John Meyer up there. Hi, yeah, thank you. Yeah, just kind of while we're talking about roles and where they sit within Sky, I'm teaching um, video journalism specifically. So where does video journalism sit at the moment is in, because we talked about multi-skilling, mm -hmm. um, so I'm talking about one person with a video camera, video journalism within Sky. Well, I'm sorry, you, you go ahead. You, no, you're saying in terms of the reporter who shoots their own stuff, that kind of video journalist role? Yeah, the one, the one person the VJ. package, VJ. Yeah. It's still a rarity at the moment, um, as Neil highlighted, you know, in extremists or for a, or for a particular treatment, um, it is used because our reporters, um, some of them, are more able to do that. I think the, the, uh, the route one choice, I would say, is still where we can afford to have um, a journalist to concentrate on the story, um, maybe in liaison with a producer back at base. We have a role we call package producers. This is in the sort of television world, but increasingly that's now becoming, what's the, what's the expression for it, a content processing sort of person, where you're saying, okay, if you shoot that element for me, that'll be great for the package, but can you also shoot this and this, because we need that for the phone app and we need this for the iPad. So uh, the, the sort of requests that go out from this machine in the middle to the news gatherers are multifaceted requests now, which puts a great burden on somebody. I, I think, you know, there's certain things. Look, it's, it's the obvious thing is you have to report on court cases and you we, will sometimes get in a scramble where the guilty party, the alleged guilty party, whatever it is, is coming out of court. I wouldn't send anyone but a two-man crew to, well, three, the correspondent, the cameraman, and a sounder to look after the camera guy or girl because in that kind of thing, they'll just fall over. And a VJ can't possibly do that you know, you won't, you won't get in the scrum, Rolf Harris coming out of court as a one guy with an iPhone. Horses for courses, Neil, is that fair enough? Yeah, I mean, we, we don't deploy VJs on a, you know, it's not like we have a VJ in the Bristol Bureau or the Manchester Bureau, so that we don't have, but we want people with camera skills. So like the Joe Tidy in the Shetland example, he is not a VJ, but he has VJ skills. And we know he's got those skills. So when it comes to who are we going to send, what kind of, content can we get for digital we go well joe's got the vj skills so let's send him and he can just operate on his own so i think like i was saying with the west of england correspondent jobs quite recently they all came with vj skills and well that was all if you hadn't had those vj skills we probably would have gone for the candidate who did so i think they're vital skills really gives you extra flexibility isn't it flexibility yeah, yeah. okay yeah. john microphone on its way yep Hi, I'm John Mayer. I teach at Brunel, amongst other places. Um, I'm intrigued that Sony Sky News here today, but, but leave that aside. Where are the BBC and where are ITN? Let's, I'm going to ask Neil two or three little questions. How do they, what, what appeals to you in a CV that comes to you? What appeals to you when they come through the door? Mm -hmm. What appeals to you when, when they do work experience? Right. And do you send them home? <laughs> and on, on, on autocar, they send people home on Tuesday lunchtime. They just say, look, you're wasting your time, we're wasting our time. They sent Eddie Jordan's daughter home once. So do you ever send people home? <laughs> Did they really? We have, um, we have sent people home. You know, we have actually had to take people to one side and say, look, this is not working out. Uh, don't come back. But that's very rare. Uh, what do I look for in a CV? I look in a C mainly for a commitment of evidence, a commitment, evidence of a commitment to a career in journalism, by which I mean uh, what work experience have they done, really. I'm, you know, I don't really look at O level, uh, GCSEs, O levels, A levels, all that kind of thing. I'm kind of looking at where are they studying, what are they studying, but mainly, what have they done journalistically? So, so how you look at portfolio as well. Yes, I have looked at portfolios. Yes, uh, and that, that 
counts for a lot, I would say. <laughs> but I, I want to know that they've done a week on the Times or the Telegraph or been to the BBC local newsroom or uh, an ITV regional newsroom or have done a commercial radio station or local paper or college, been on the editor of the college paper, all of that kind of thing. And that, for me, I mean, I'm just one guy in one organisation looking at hundreds of applications, but that, for me, is the starting point. So I don't really mind what their academic past is particularly. Well, I mind to a point, but I more mind what have they got to offer me in terms of evidence of a commitment. When they come through the door, I will have interviewed them by Skype. We only started doing that quite recently because I was getting people through the door who I'd brought in on paper and then been, in some cases, disappointed when they turned up on the door, uh, through the door. So uh, I now interview them by Skype, and uh, by and large, 80% of the time, uh, the ones I think are good on paper are good on, on Skype. Some cannot sell themselves very well, and I say, I'm not having this person in the, in the newsroom. And I, I don't mean that in a bad way, I just think I, I've got to ask my colleagues, you know, Martin, I've got a 21 year old, really good student coming in, can you? look after them for two weeks and we're all you know everyone's dead busy the news is happening all around us and we're asking colleagues to take time out to explain the job essentially to these people and I want them to be willing uh, and sociable people to have around uh, around the office. And once they're there what are you looking for? Uh, uh, oh right that's I, what I always say to people when they come in don't be irritating <laughs> uh, and John There's don't, plenty of people in the building who are irritating enough. Don't be irritating, but don't, don't be a shrinking violet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's quite difficult actually. You know, they're coming into a big, busy media organisation with everyone fleeing around with no time to spend and you know shouting and whatever. You know, uh, and I say to them, look, you know, you've got to f f sort of plough quite a course here because you don't want to irritate people by pestering them the whole time nor do you want to be a shrinking violet sitting in a corner who no one knows from one day to next what you're doing or if you're not there one day people don't miss you you know you've got to it's, it's quite tricky actually but the, the, the success the most successful candidates are the ones who come in get on with everybody what else can I do I finished that job what can I do next I'll be here tomorrow what do you want me to get on with and just kind of get on with people that's they're the people who you know do well and and I've been recruiting for work experience for quite a long time and uh, the ones that do really well end up getting brought in as freelancers contract staff positions and there's a lot of them now at Sky News have all come in on the work experience program so it does work okay we've got another question in the middle yeah Thank you. Hi, Neil. It's about the work experience, and I don't know whether you're the right person to speak to about this, but um, you've just had your two placements advertised. And we have, and one of the provisos is that you have to have 100 words per minute shorthand. And I have a student who didn't apply because he has dyslexia and is not mm -hmm. up to 100. Um, he thinks he can get there. What, what would you advise him to do that? Is it, what is Sky's policy if you've got something like that? Is it just think, you're so in the wrong industry? or For Sky News, we don't ask for shorthand for work is it, experience. Is it I think Sky it's a Sky Sports, News? yeah. Oh, okay. I was just talking to Richard about this beforehand. Mm. So Sky uh, Sports, because they want people to do shorthand mm. for football news conferences and everything, mm. they insist on it. We don't. I mean, that was a policy that was brought in before my time. Mm. So I mean, it's quite nice to have, mm. obviously, mm -hmm. but we don't insist on it for work mm. placement. <coughs> okay. Um, perhaps we can um, move on to the second clip and talk a little bit about that because I think it's really uh, interesting and it illustrates the way the studio is developing and, and technology and so on. So this clip um, is the use of the video wall on a package about the cost of living. So a lot of graphics playing in the sink all through the wall and the presenter working it all off their mini iPad and walking and talking as well. So perhaps you could play the second clip and then talk a little bit about that. Well, of all of the economic stories we've reported in the past few years, this one is the one that has lasted the longest and affected the most people, the squeeze or cost of living crisis. Now, as you can see, over the past few years, over the past five years, we've had inflation outpacing wages. You can see here inflation, the red line, wages, the blue line. And the upshot of this is that in real terms, people have got poorer. But now wages, excluding bonuses, are rising at an annual rate of 1.3%. You can see it here over on the far side here, 1.3% 
compared with inflation, which is down at 1.2%. Not a lot of difference, but nonetheless, it is above their first time in five years. And today, the Bank of England also forecasts that in the coming months, inflation is going to fall further, perhaps even beneath 1%. So the squeeze could really be at an end. The Bank of England governor would also have to send a letter of explanation to the Chancellor. It also said, by the way, that growth uh, this year would remain comfortably above 3% although it could drop to 2.9% next year, which is a little lower uh, than previously expected. That came as official figures showed unemployment has fallen by another 115,000 to 1.96 million. That's a rate uh, of 6%, by the way. That's encouraging news for the bank. What we are seeing is encouraging signs in the labour market, encouraging signs with respect to pay. We are seeing the start of real pay growth. This is consistent with our forecasts from earlier this year, consi absolutely consistent with our forecast in August. We expect this to, this pickup to accelerate. Um, I think our underlying assumption uh, for two, 2015 is average weekly earnings growing a little above 3%. So with inflation running around 1%, 1.5%, that's real, real wage growth. But, you know, one swallow doesn't make a summer. I mean, with this, this, this has to persist for the, uh, for the recovery to be durable. But are people really feeling the recovery? Shadow Chancellor Ed Balls says there's not much yet to cheer about. The idea that people in Britain are going to be celebrating when for month after month, over four years, they have become worse off and worse off and worse off as prices have gone up faster than wages. Come on. Um, it's much too early to say it's over. It's a real living experience for most people today in our country worrying about rising bills, having to have part time work or wages which have not kept pace with prices for year after year. So the big risk is that this strong growth is going to be undermined by weakness from Europe. For while Britain's economy, and just look at here, here, grew by 0.8% in the second quarter uh, of the year, you can see that Germany, that shrank by 0.2%. France, that essentially stagnated, 0% growth. Italy, down by 0.2% as well. Spain, actually, one of the few bright spots, and those Euro crisis countries are doing relatively well, 0.6% in Spain. We'll learn whether Germany, Europe's powerhouse, is in recession on Friday. So, uh, Martin, I mean, all broadcasters are using these big, big screens in the studios like this now. Um, a lot of technology and complexity going into telling a kind of clear story about quite a complicated story. What goes into producing a spot like that? And what are the kind of, you know, the skills that are needed and, and, and how has that changed well, and developed? I, I think it's the storytelling, isn't it, and how to simplify it. That's Ed Conway, our um, economics editor. And I'm sure he's had to put aside a lot of his economics qualifications to distill the story down. I think he, like many specialists, still finds that a frustration. But that, I mean, as a, as a brilliant aside, I always think, and a shout out for my old career in Radio News, if ever you want an idea of concise storytelling, a Radio 5 Live News Bulletin, or even the ones on Radio 2, and I don't mean to patronise by saying that, is an artful bit of writing of how to take a complicated topic and rack off six stories in the space of three minutes. It's a wonderful, <coughs> wonderful skill. And the BBC, God bless them, are brilliant at it to this day. So on that same principle, though, you've got a complicated topic. What are you trying to say? You've only got two and a half minutes to say it. it's picture starved because you've only got the couple of speakers that you want to include. So the big graphic screen can work quite well. Um, I felt that uh, we included that as it wasn't a particularly shining example, no disrespect to Ed, but it proved the trouble we have in terms of so that was presented live, probably without any rehearsal, in our main studio. The, there's the main anchor desk and then the big screen is in the background and a, and a jib camera is flying in. I felt that our studio director was obviously trying to stay on top of that, but he, was, he she was having to direct that camera, the single camera, to give that was a sort of treatment of it, to keep it on the jib camera. Um, and maybe we didn't get close enough to the wall, we didn't really see the detail, maybe two shots would have worked better in other ways. Um, and that's 
a very linear story. That's a bit like running a PowerPoint, basically. There was a stack put together. Ed would have worked with a producer and then a graphics designer to put that up. And that sort of look, that palette of blue graph paper, slightly curved at the bottom in a rather sexy fashion, uh, is a sort of standard off-the-shelf number. And then they pop the graphics on top, and you can drop the videos and all that kind of stuff. But what goes in, what goes out, that was a very linear production. What Ed has done, and I've done in the past, is you can actually now, again, our boffins have helped us here with our graphics playout equipment, is you can devise um, a number of branching routes where you go off somewhere, and the iPad comes into its own there, because you are actually driving the wall. A bit like a weather forecaster, since time immemorial has some kind of clicky switch that advances the weather pages through the sequence. Now, you can, and increasingly we're using the ability that a presenter, correspondent or whatever, with the right storytelling device, can have some material. Classic on this would be the American elections, um, Obama last time around. These things are often, let's be honest, producers put them on air to fill a bit of air time. You know, keep going, Martin. And then, you know, blah, blah, blah. we're just getting another guest in or something's being lined up in Washington, things like that. So my segment might be three minutes in the rundown, but it ends up being five. Or on the other hand, suddenly something more important happens and something pops on and what you thought you were going to be three minutes ends up as being one and a half. It's great, I think, um, that presenters then can trim, a trim the article, trim the item according to the need. And I had the ability, thanks to, again, our boffins and the way they work out the storytelling, to include part one, part two, part three, or I can actually jump straight from one to three if circumstances need, and then jump back to two. So this is all a big team effort, really, isn't it? I mean, it you've is. You've got the presenter it or is. the correspondent. You've got the producer who's helping put the package together. You've got the editor who's making the big choices about where it runs now, long for. Yeah. You've got a studio director who's managing the cameras, and they've all got to work together it's all, in a coordinated in ideally way. Ideally, it all works to together. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, a lot of a lot of roles and different kinds of skills there yeah. that any broadcaster now doing those kinds of uh, yeah. production is is, is going to. And need. a word for the graphics artist as well, because Absolutely. that would. We, we, so, so very simple graphics on screen, um, producers can put together with template formats now, but something like that, that would have been a graphic designer lending their expertise to the okay. party as well. We've got a question here. Can anyone in this audience quote back any of those figures that was in that piece? I can, but I, I doesn't count. <laughs> Yes, one person volunteers are you, are you suggesting so, that it failed then as a, a bit of communicating? Well, <laughs> it's just a lot of figures. And yes, there, there, there were trends, that, obviously there were trends that coming out of it. But it, it, it threw a, an awful lot of figures at us. And I just mm. wonder if it was, you know, the gizmo's there, let's use it, let's put lots of figures up. But mm. I just wonder, just in the end, how useful uh, 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 yeah, well, I mean, it's an absolutely fair point. If it didn't work, it didn't work. I mean, I have, I have to say, as someone who used to produce Peter J on the BBC <laughs> 20 years ago, it's got a lot better and a lot simpler and a lot easier than it used to be, I promise you. <laughs> I suppose in terms of the editorial of that piece, the, t the real telling thing was that the way the earnings and the inflation graph had crossed over, and maybe visually we didn't really ram that point home yeah. for the viewer. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, the point is there are a lot more tools for story, even if you don't think it was very good storytelling. Exactly. Nevertheless, we've got a lot more tools to play with and yeah. a lot of skills and opportunity to try and... Yeah, I wasn't trying to, to say it wasn't good storytelling. It was mm. just it was just a, a question though, about the use sure. of figures mm. and how we use them. Okay. We've got, another, we've got another question here and one here. Hello. Uh, uh, Justin Greetham, Senior Lecturer in Visualisation and Graphical Applications in Perfect. School of Computing at Teesside University. Perfect segue. Um, <laughs> can you tell me what are the prerequisites to uh, obviously having a work placement as a graphic designer, as you call them? Mm. Um, the Not Sky News uh, graphic designers all come under a different department. There's a Sky Creative department. And I'm not actually quite sure how they run their work experience. So I do the editorial work placements and creative do their work placements. That said, um, we do take people on work placements in graphics because there was a guy left just last week who came in on the work experience three years ago and has been there ever since. Um, I think you need to be on probably one of your one of the courses that it sounds like you're involved with um, 
And again, I, I would imagine I would apply the same criteria as I would use for editorial. Where, where's the commitment? Show me the evidence. You know, do you just fancy it because you quite like the idea of it, or are you really into it and you can prove that you're really into it? You know, I mean, there will be you know, different people to contact, um, but we do. You know, Sky has the, uh, a future talent department, uh, which is all about getting young people in the, the next generation of producers, journalists, the, graphic designers. The, these lines are blurring though, aren't they? You know, because, I mean, I know at the yeah. BBC they now have a visual journalism department That's which right. mixes all of these kind of data skills, graphic yeah. skills, editorial skills are all you know, working in, in a kind of mixed teams and so on as well. We've, so these things are crossing over. Yeah. We've rapidly. only started to scratch the surface of big data, which I think yeah. is going to be another area well, which I wanted you, to come and you talk probably about are talking about to yeah. your students about already, but yeah. uh, I think television or, or the visual storytellers have, have yet to really get hold of that. As well, a, let, let's pick that up in a moment, but we have another question here. Uh, yeah, Nick Bamford from Bournemouth University. Um, I run the, the television production course for producer directors. Uh, looking again at work experience um, possibilities, all our students do four weeks as part of the course. Do you have a use for people with specifically production, producer, director, current affairs type experiences rather than, you, you've talked a lot about journalism and journalistic mm. experience. Um, is, are just simply production, studio skills useful to you as well? Um, so that would be what people running studios and sound Yeah, they all have studio and live, and uh, live multi-camera experience as well yeah. as... Um, yeah, we, we, we do take people um, on work placement as well. I mean, again, that is, sits slightly out of side my remit because it's a kind of um, operations area. So we do, we do take people, but we take fewer. I mean, the, 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 because it's so bedded in journalism, what we do, that's why we take 60 people every year, you know, on, on the editorial side. Um, but. We've also had sort of graduate opportunities and apprenticeships and that kind of thing on the more technical side of things. Um, so that might be where your guys might fit. All right. Well, and what about sort of studio direction skills and those kind of things? Or? I'm not aware of any work experience, but I, it, it's all it can be done quite informally. To be honest, mm. it's almost like tell me the name of a director at Sky News, can I come in and shadow you for three days or a week or something like that? I mean, can, it I can work tend, like that. I think because the direction skills for our live um, output is pretty full on, um, we would tend, I think, I'm fair to saying, Neil, we would recruit from existing people who have come up from the regions, people who have got a, a pretty impressive showreel of where they've done it at a basic level. That said, a word for our... Um, arguably the most humble role, but the most uh, opportunity role in the newsroom is the newsroom runner. We have a, um, a runner role in the newsroom, and I think it's fair to say, which although you spend six months or so, you come in, get a job, and you're working 12-hour days sorting mail and getting coffee for the likes of me and things like that, um, it sounds dreadful. All of them, bar none, find their niche as a researcher, producer, I know guys, um, girls are going to, to be sound um, people and then camera people in time. They all go into the business. So um, some, some more non-specific role like that within a news organisation, just to get your foot in the door, is a great place to go. And then you find what you're really interested in. You know, you can excel. You can soak up all the stuff that's going on. OK, another uh, question over here. Hello, Linda Lewis from Goldsmiths University. Um, I have a question about uh, work placements and your attitude uh, towards them possibly being integrated into assessments. Um, I worked with Neil last couple of years when I was at City University um, with uh, City students uh, going to uh, Sky on placement. Um, you probably know that a number of the courses represented here will be accredited by the Broadcast Journalism Training Council. and. Um, their requirements are that students on accredited courses have to do 15 days of mm. placements um, as part of the, the, the course. Now, there's a bit of a dilemma here because we came under pressure last year at City. We were asked, were the students that we were sending on placement, was this part of their MA, um, and were, were, the, were the placements actually assessed? To which my thought was, uh, you know, you're running a newsroom, mm. very difficult for you to actually be assessing students as part of their degree. But there does seem to be uh, an appetite for it. And I wondered if you, if you did actually um, assess or work, work together with universities to assess. And if the requirement was there, would you be able to do it? Or would it actually 
stop you wanting to take students on placements? No, and I think that some kind of assessment would be okay. I mean, I would be quite happy to do that. It might actually make the students who come in a bit more fired up for, you know, getting more out of it. I think the only danger is, are we going to be lumbered with a lot more paperwork? I mean, that would be the thing, you know, do, are we required? I mean, everything I've had to do with apprenticeships and things like that is all great, but then it, it comes with a lot of, this must be done, and this is the structure, and every two weeks you have to have this conversation, and then you have to write it down and report back, and all that, that kind of thing. So I have no, personally, I have no, I wouldn't have any particular objection to assessing it. It could be quite beneficial to both. I would just counsel against any huge administration around it, that would be my only concern. And do you find that the students that come to you on placements, because you're obviously recruiting from quite a wide pool, uh, are some of them uh, assessed or are they coming as part of their studies as opposed to um, Well, some I have to write a report and send it to their tutor. Uh, uh, not that many actually, but uh, there are some colleges who seem to expect some kind of report back from me saying they came and they were great and marked them out of 10 on various things. Um, and that's quite a quick sort of form filling exercise and that, that works quite well. I've got no objection to doing that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, we talked uh, briefly, touched briefly on data journalism, mm. data visualisation, and I suppose not, not quite the same, but adjacent to it, the whole question of social media skills and so on. How, how important is that at the moment within the newsroom, and you know, is that going to grow, or do you think it's, a, it's kind of peaked and it's a fad, or you know, what are we, what are you, what's your feeling about uh, both uh, social media and, and the whole data question? I think social media will, will continue to grow for the time being. I mean, I think there are big audiences there we're finding for Sky News content and I was just in a meeting before I came here at Sky News HQ about boosting our social media team. Um, so I think that certainly will will develop. I think like everything else it has to be treated with caution to some extent. We don't want to get carried away but uh, it's got an important part to play. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, and a lot of our content is now being seen on Facebook and YouTube and I was talking, in fact I was talking to Ben DePere who's the editor of Channel 4 News and they've done some kind of deal with Mashable uh, to get their content out to a younger audience uh, via, via that platform. And then, yeah, the whole um, visualisation thing, I think uh, you've got, you know, like The Guardian does it really well uh, and I think that is something that we need to get into more as traditional TV broadcasters. Um, I think at the minute, if I'm honest, we're, you know, trying to to get there and we need to do more of it and take a leaf out of people who are doing it really well at the moment. Do any of you use the Prezi app, which is the sort of PowerPoint on acid type thing, isn't it, where you can bounce stuff around and fly? I mean, I, I, I talked about this. I think some of the graphic design guys were sort of into that and they've sort of made Prezi-like things, but we don't actually use it like the real thing as a, as a just, I've knocked up a Prezi presentation and done it. And I sometimes, sometimes think that might lend itself. I think it's fair to say, no, we, we don't, we're kind of feeling our way here. We're in, yeah, we're in we're fairly in. uncharted Good waters. Morning. And there's certainly, I think we established that great pictures, great stories well told still work on television. There's still an appetite for that. And although we know nobody under the age of 30 ever watches television or linear television anymore, there's still an awful lot of people, myself included, over the age of 30, who want, maybe at some point, a nice news bulletin where they're going to sit back and just say, all right, Tell me what's, in, what's happening in the world, and uh, I'll make a judgment as to whether I believe you or not. So we've got to deal with that, but we've also got to get really good at effectively engaging and communicating news and information with the younger audiences. And it may be that graphics-led, information-led, data-led journalism uh, fits that role very well. I mean, certainly a graphic that would look rather daft on a television screen often works brilliantly on the iPad, you know, because right. you, the distance you're viewing it and things like that. OK, we had an, uh, another question back again here at the front. Uh, we're coming into the final round of questions, so get those hands up. Hi. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about big data? What, and what we're doing with it? Yes. Well, we're not, I don't think we're doing enough it, it, it. In the context of people understanding, like the gentleman reported, what do those figures mean? They don't understand them. Do most people understand the news being out of context because you don't have enough time to provide the context. You're under pressure. That's an interesting thought in terms of, I mean, the fact that you don't have 
these two audiences, if I can simplify it, and it's probably not a fair simplification, but if you have the traditional linear viewer, sit-back viewer, who may take in at least 15 minutes of news in a, in a, in a linear process, I think you can explain things in one way in the introduction, in the first package that you run, and then a bit of qualification or analysis. Right? When you go to the digital media, you've got a notification that pops up on the screen which says, what have you got on there? You've got probably 25, wor 25 letters in five words. So you've got to convey something there. And where does that hot link take you to? Um, you then can't get into a great big data set on an Excel file, can you? Or can you? I mean, maybe that's more a news newspaper business. Okay, uh, is that what you're... Yes, yeah, so the extension to the question is, is a lot of your news gathering desk-based? People who are comfortable in their offices, mm. editing, interpreting, mm -hmm. as, well, oppo as opposed to being is, out in the field with I, their iPhone. Well, yeah, yeah. I think both both are still valid, and I think we need both. We need better people to process the news, the output team, if you like, to deliver. But we still need people out in the field, don't we? Going to get yeah. the news ourselves and see it. And the eyewitness account of what's happening in the floods is always going to be told through Nick Martin or, or a number of other colleagues in helicopters down on the ground. And I know it's a bit of a cliche, but yes, they bought waders, so they're up to their waist and doing a piece to camera. That, that is still valid, I think, even with the most sophisticated well, desk bound. I think where data is concerned, I think we need the journalists with the skills who can turn a story into a data experience. I mean, I think that I was talking to Richard before, but I did a course at Cardiff where um, you know we're getting I think the students are learning about you know data journalism as well as doing a bit of coding and everything. And I think in the future we'll really prize journalists who have those skills. Uh, I think our journalists are TV journalists, radio journalists, online journalists. We want people with the skills who can do data journalism. Okay, we've got just time for one yeah, final question up in the middle, at the back there. Just wait for the microphone to reach you. Um, Carol of University of York. Um, I work with uh, some local television stations. There are now over 26 local television licenses. Would you see local television as a useful experience for students? Yes. I would. I mean, I think any experience like that is valid on a CV and would make me interested in knowing more about that candidate. But I think, you know, my point about that experience is I'd almost expect to have that and two other things before someone came into Sky News on work experience. And just as an, an, an addition, we're working with a technology strategy board project that's actually looking at um, data mining. And we're actually looking at how, we, through local television, how we can turn the big data into local television stories. And it's incredibly interesting. Right. So mm, we'll good. watch that space. Yeah. I mean, one, yeah. one facet you didn't actually ask about, but I mean, we, uh, Neil indicated we can't have sh too many shrinking violets. And it's certainly in our newsroom still, you need to have people who are resilient enough to enjoy a deadline. I mean, there's no point in coming into a newsroom if you're going to burst into tears, if the editor says, I need that at five o'clock, and then he doesn't make, and things like that. You can expect a bollocking, or at least you know, in these lovely tree-hugging days, a gentle telling off. Um, but you know, you've got to get, you, I think you have to be able to convey the sense of excitement. And to, why I say that is your lo any kind of experience, any kind of broadcast experience, any kind of thing with a red light pulsing away or a big clock ticking round to the pips, it's got to be great, and you've got to, your students have kind of got to get off on that, otherwise they're not going to fit in. Okay, you. got any final, final question? Otherwise we're going to go to the quiz. I'm going to put, put you all to the test. <laughs> no? Okay, so we'll go to, we'll go to the quiz. So uh, any, any new recruit uh, trying to get through the doors of Sky News has to be able to answer uh, these five questions. So we'll see how you all do, and then um, we'll check it with the experts here and see if they know the answers. Um, so the first one, uh, hands up if you know this, who is the Defence Secretary? Who is the Defence Secretary? You can't answer. No. <laughs> yes, sir? Sorry? Do, what? Nope. Yeah. Um, Michael Fallon. Michael Fallon, yes, correct, well done. Um, John Meyer, right, uh, this one's easy. What does Justin Welby do for a living? Well done. Oh, we're on fire here. It's fantastic. <laughs> okay, here's an ethical, ethical issue. Would you quote or cite unsubstantiated criticism of a person or official body that you found in a tweet? 
Everyone seems to say no. Is there anyone who says maybe? No? All right, you're all excellent. Well done. <laughs> uh, uh, and similarly on the, because uh, we're all very keen on, on ethics today, um, when is it okay to film someone without their knowledge and to use the footage in a TV report? What circumstances is it what to film somebody without their knowledge or permission? <laughs> I know you're going to know, John. I'll come to you in a minute. You've already answered Lady one. Yep. Yeah. It's in the public interest. Yep, public interest. Anything else? Other avenues have been exhausted. But... Possibly, yeah. <laughs> Illegal or immoral. Public interest, yep, broadly, fine, very good. And then finally, you happen to be in town when there's a massive fire at a power plant. You get some video on your phone, name three ways you can get the video back to the studio quickly. Any thoughts? You got it on your phone, how do you get it back? Email, retransfer. It, yep. Oh, wait, online. <laughs> yep, email, yeah, okay. Any FTP. other? FTP, any other thoughts? Fine. Fine, yeah. yep. Yep. Do I need to find anything else? Dropbox. Dropbox. Yep. Stick it on Facebook. Stick it on YouTube. Send it as an SMS if you can get it through. Fine. You're all obviously excellent and potential recruits for Sky News. Very well done. Uh, your 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 two-week work placement awaits you all.